Hello and welcome everybody to another exciting episode of Side Talks 2.0. As always, my name is Dr. Jack Saxanian, and in today's episode, I have a very wonderful and exciting guest to talk about the recent outbreak of the coronavirus. She's an infectious disease physician and an assistant professor at Cedar Sinai Medical Center who deals with a lot of um, topics related with infectious diseases. And recently she has given multiple talks regarding specifically the coronavirus. So she's here today to talk to us about this epidemic and give us uh, the facts and the details regarding this and kind of bust the myths that has been going around on in the media regarding some of the details related with the coronavirus. So with that, I wanna introduce Dr. Priya Soni and she will introduce herself as well, give us a quick background about herself and tell us all about the coronavirus. So Dr. Soni, please, can you introduce yourself and tell us about what you do and uh, give us a little bit of information about the coronavirus. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Dr. Priya Soni, like you said. Um, I'm a pediatric infectious disease specialist, so I specialize in taking care of children uh, with all types of infections. I'm a clinician, but also I do some clinical translational research um, with Kawasaki disease specifically in children and looking at the microbiome um, with Kawasaki disease. Um, but with everything that's been going on, I've um, taken it upon myself, obviously, to, to really stay abreast of all the information and research that's come out with uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, which causes the entity called COVID-19, which you guys I'm sure have heard so much about, so. Awesome. Um, so can you tell people uh, that are uh, hearing a lot of information on um, TV, the news and other sources, of what is the coronavirus and um, why there's so much, um, let's just say panic going around about that? Yeah, so um, coronaviruses have been around for hundreds of years, right? So there are many different types of coronaviruses that are known to infect humans. Um, there are four major coronaviruses that are known to infect humans that cause just basically a mild cold and literally don't have any cause of mortality. They don't, you know, they don't kill you and you just get a little bit of a cold. Now, there have been three particular coronaviruses that have been popping up in the last few decades that have been of particular interest as they've made the jump from an animal species to a human. Um, the first of which was with SARS, which we know um, was an outbreak that started in 2002, 2003, um, which started in China as well, but um, eventually we found out that that was kind of related to um, civid cats in China as the intermediate host. Um, that ended up becoming a pandemic. I think there were about 8,000 cases, around 800 some deaths. Um, but now, of course, we've contained that particular virus. The second coronavirus that's made the jump from, I guess, animals to humans is MERS. So the Middle Eastern um, Respiratory Syndrome is another type of coronavirus that was implicated in 2012 or so. Um, specifically confined to the Arabian Peninsula, but um, it has a higher mortality rate. We just didn't see as many cases. Um, there were a couple hundred cases of which uh, many people died, but that um, we still see circulating here and there, but it's not as big of an issue as, as now moving forward to, to now with uh, SARS-CoV-2, um, also uh, known as COVID-19. So. Um, that's kind of the background and history on these particular coronaviruses, but know that they've been around since pretty much the, they've been discovered and noted by humans since the 1960s, but have probably been amongst us for, for you know, hundreds of years. Uh, uh, if I may interject and ask a quick couple of questions regarding definitions, can you maybe quickly, briefly tell us what it is for something to be a pandemic versus an epidemic? and what are these terms that we see in the media all the time and what do they actually mean in terms of epidemiological uh, definitions? Yeah, so, um, uh, so first, um, you know, there's all these terms that are being thrown out and I think it's important to note that an epidemic 
is something that sort of sustained transmission um, ongoing in, in multiple different areas um, that's just amongst us. A pandemic is sort of on a global scale of an epidemic, um, widespread throughout pretty much all countries. And so um, whether or not this uh, COVID-19 has already moved towards a pandemic is, is, is probably a mute point. You know, I think uh, we're already getting there with the numbers now. Just, I just checked a few minutes ago um, on the Hopkins tracker up to 113,000 um, people so that are infected. And I mean, I think we have to keep in mind that pandemic doesn't equate to the world's population being wiped out. You know, we had a pandemic of H1N1 influenza, right? And, and then we, we were able to um, get that strain of the virus within our flu shots that we take every year. And it's still circulating among us, but it's not you know, wiped out half of the population. So we can't be afraid of the P word. And I think that's one of the messages that I want to um, bring across to you today. That, that's that, that's wonderful because I, I know people are, are telling me, well, it's a pandemic, you know, and they hear historical terms being used with the word yeah. pandemic and wiping half of the world population. And the word, I, that's, that's why I want you to clarify because it doesn't mean it's going to kill people. It just means yeah. the amount of spread across the, the globe. Exactly. And, and just to um, kind of expand on that, you know, I've had a lot of people tell me, oh, it's like the, the Spanish flu of 1918, um, where 50 million people were infected, things like that. You know, we're talking about a very different time period in life, right? So that was a pre-vaccine, pre-antibiotic era. Um, in terms of um, technology infrastructure, we just didn't have the means to um, handle this sort of outbreak, which we do now. And so let's keep that in perspective too. Awesome. Um, so going along with that, um, can you tell us a little bit about some of the symptoms people uh, have been experiencing and specifically with this infection? Um, I know in general, uh, there's the, you know, the potential, the cough and a fever, but are there any specific symptoms that are related with this or is it just the general, you know, feeling sick sort of stuff? <clears throat> yeah. So the symptoms actually vary. So it can be pretty mild course where you just have a little bit of a runny nose, cough congestion. Um, but the main symptoms that the CDC really wants you to be aware of is fever. Up to 83% of patients that um, have been studied with this do have a fever. Um, shortness of breath, as well as respiratory distress moving to respiratory failure. Now, if you're at that point, um, you're probably going to be one of the ones that has more of a severe course, if that, those are your earlier symptoms um, within the course of this infection. But um, some people just have a mild sort of cold and they uh, recover from it. And what we're seeing is that the majority of people, uh, over 50%, you know, have, have, have recovered from this without any complication. Um, so this is like just getting the cold, but it, the question I get from a lot of people is that then why is there so much media coverage on this and why, yeah. uh, I mean, I've seen uh, images of Costco being cleaned from all of their water and toilet papers that people are worried that they may be quarantined or something. Is that something people should actually be concerned about then? Yeah, I mean, I think what we know so far, of course, this is a very rapidly evolving topic, but what we do know is that the people that have died have been particularly in a specific age group. So 50 year old and above, um, particularly uh, patients that have other comorbid conditions. What that means is if you're um, an adult above 50 with uh, heart disease, if you have um, something called COPD, which is um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, diabetes, some of those other comorbid conditions that already cause your immune system to be a little bit stressed and in a state of inflammation. Um, some of those patients um, are, are not having as great outcomes as other people. So those are particularly the ones that are being most affected by this virus. And um, there are up to about 29% that I read um, progress to what we call ARDS, which stands for acute respiratory distress syndrome. And um, it's, it's basically 
your, your lungs um, have kind of gone into overdrive and it sets off an inflammatory cascade that you can't recover from. Um, and a lot of patients that develop ARDS with this infection um, that are older, they, they do end up passing away, unfortunately. Um, and a lot of patients that also develop uh, this infection that are older with other comorbid conditions can also get co-infection with other things. Um, so co-infection with a bacterial process like pneumonia that eventually uh, leads to their demise. So uh, the take home point is older adults, um, particularly uh, affected by this and they are um, the ones that are unfortunately dying from this. Now, is this any more unusual than an older, older adult with comorbidities getting the flu, for example? Because to me, it seems that it's no different than getting the flu if you're an older adult who hasn't got the vaccine and has all these comorbidities. Yeah, great question. I think the short answer to that is we're still trying to figure it out. Um, as you know, each flu season is different, right? So this particular flu season for 2019-2020 is um, kind of on par with our previous year. Um, but in 2017, uh, the flu strain that was circulating was a little more virulent. And at that point, um, we were seeing way more deaths. But just to keep things in perspective, um, I do want your your audience to know that the flu has killed uh, upwards to 20,000 plus patients this year. Um, and the final numbers we'll find for sure in, in the next coming months, but the flu is definitely um, causing more mortality than this right now. Um, the problem with the, well, the, the thing with the flu is that we know that the flu will eventually, the flu season will kind of die down, right? So flu will cer certainly stop circulating by um, April, May, June, definitely. Um, we're not gonna see as much activity. We're already, this is week three of decreased activity of flu. Um, I just checked the CDC today and um, we don't know what's going to happen with the coronavirus. Um, we don't know if it'll continue to circulate um, even given changes in seasonal patterns, so. But if it were to follow some of its other predecessors or its family members, we expect sometimes the the warmer season to decrease? The, maybe, yeah. Maybe. Yeah, the, maybe. And I hope so. And I think we all hope so. But if we look at um, the SARS data, um, we see that SARS sort of continued to circulate um, even in the warmer months. And and even so now, we see that there are certain countries like Thailand, Philippines, um, warmer climates where we're seeing cases of COVID-19. So um, I think the, the, your, the answer to your question is a little complicated, but um, it's to be determined what happens with this. And um, the main thing is, this is probably like another version of the flu, maybe the flu on steroids, a little bit of a uh, more robust virus, but um, we will get through this and there will be a time, usually these coronaviruses cycle out um, in about a two year cycle. So um, hopefully sooner than that, if we can get um, a vaccine and kind of um, work with that and get some sort of treatment options, but um, typically they tend to die out in a two year cycle. So what, what should people watch out for in, in, the, in that instance? Uh, in the meantime, um, should they avoid travel altogether? And what are some of the precautionary things that they could do to avoid either passing it on to their elderly family members or even contracting it themselves? Great question. So um, right now for travel, it's um, we have governments and um, you know, political systems working in all sorts of ways like to contain the virus um, and to stop its spread, but it is going to spread, you know, viruses don't respect borders. Um, and if you think about the amount of travel we had when the SARS pandemic occurred in 2002, about a, a billion travelers, and now we have 5 billion travelers um, going all over the world. So um, keeping that in mind, um, it's really stopping travel is just sort of like a temporizing measure, right? So if you have a cut on your leg, you apply pressure to stop the wound from bleeding. Um, it will slow things down, 
but um, it's not going to necessarily stop the spread of this virus. Um, what you should know is that the CDC has made recommendations to limit travel to certain high-risk countries. So what that means is they're um, recommending no travel um, for leisure or um, other purposes to, to China, to South Korea, Italy, um, and Japan as well. So those are the, the four main countries um, that are sort of having the most travel restrictions right now. Within the US, you know, I think it's important to um, exhibit precaution and to make sure you're doing the normal things, you know, washing your hands at least 20 seconds with warm soap and, or with warm water and soap, um, or using it. Not, not, not to cut you off, but just to tell the viewers, you should always be washing your hands, oh, yeah. re regardless if there's a pandemic, an epidemic, or Please, a, yes. washing yeah, your I hands is always a good idea. Absolutely, you know, and, um, you know, if you don't have access to a sink and soap and water, then at least get a 60% um, alcohol-based hand sanitizer to, um, to clean off your hands with uh, specific regards to travel. You know, I think it would be wise to, to kind of get those, maybe get um, those travel size Clorox wipes or wet ones and just kind of wipe down your tray table and the immediate surfaces because we actually don't know how long this virus lives on fomites or um, basically uh, inanimate objects. And, and so specifically those that have any kind of comorbid conditions like um, lung issues, should they avoid traveling in, in general until things are a little bit calmer or I guess based on what you're saying, as long as they're not traveling outside of the United States, they should. Yeah, I mean, you don't see sustained, and this could change, you know, um, in a week or so once we have more testing available. Um, but we're not seeing sustained sort of infection amongst different parts of um, our country yet. So um, at the moment, I think just exhibit precaution with traveling domestically and um, to really uh, be careful about um, any, any, anybody who, who you come in contact with that might be sick with a upper respiratory tract infection, you know, covering your mouth when you sneeze and cough um, and really um, just making sure if you shake hands with someone to, to wash your hands before you touch your face or your nose or your eyes, okay? And um, I, I know a lot of people are, are asking, uh, where can I get masks? Where can I get hand sanitizers? We're running out of them. Do, does everybody really need to have a mask on even if they're traveling? I mean, is that a necessary precautionary thing that they should do or only if they're sick to prevent them from passing it on? Yeah, I mean, if you are otherwise healthy with, with no respiratory symptoms, there's no reason for anybody to be wearing a mask. Um, the mask sort of gives us the perception of control, right? We think that we're, we're stopping something or we're doing something about this. So I think a lot of it is um, sort of these behavioral and cultural patterns. Um, but um, you don't need to be wearing a mask. If you have respiratory symptoms, um, you really should be at home and resting and not being um, in places like the airport, that sort of thing. So a lot of times people think that the mask is protecting them, but you think about it, all of your secretions are sort of pooling right there. And so um, the most common time that you're going to be infecting someone else or even self inoculating is when you take that mask off, right? So yes. you have to take it off properly if you do use it and you do have symptoms. Um, speaking of reinfection, is there any data? Because I've, I've seen some places where they said that, at least in China, there's some evidence that somebody who had it and and cleared the virus was somehow able to be reinfected. Is that necessarily true? Yeah, I read about that case too. And um, I think we still need more data about whether reinfection is truly a thing, or maybe that person just didn't clear the virus completely and had some prolonged shedding. Um, it's, it's, it's not clear in that particular case. So the short answer is um, not sure, but um, probably not something that you can get reinfected with um, in, in my eyes if we're looking at 
how other types of viruses in this family um, react. And then they were saying that at least in China, they found that there's two strains of this virus going on. So is it yeah. possible that getting reinfected with one versus the other, although immunologically yeah. speaking, if, you, if they're in the same family, you shouldn't be reinfected again because of the way the immune system works, at least the way I understand. Yeah. No, that, that paper that came out last week is uh, all preliminary data. And I know there's a lot of mixed feelings amongst the scientific community about the L strain and the S strain of this, this particular, the two different types of this virus. Um, I think um, we need more information. In that study, they um, basically looked at the genomes of 103 um, patients, and they were able to find this distinction. Um, we're not sure what that means in terms of like how dangerous one particular strain is to another. I think that um, there's some thought that the S strain, which is the more ancient strain, um, is circulating more amongst um, uh, outside of Wuhan and mainland China. And that one is the one that's a little less uh, dangerous and causing less issues, so less mortality. So I think the, the jury is out on what exactly this means and, and what this new information about the L and the S type of this virus mean. And um, so for people who have, um, let's say, um, um, uh, schools that they're running for like daycare centers, um, should they be concerned about shutting them down in the United States, especially given the fact that the, the younger population isn't as affected? What precautionary things should they be doing? or? it's nothing to be done until the CDC announces something at this point. Yeah, I mean, keep your, so look at the CDC, but also um, check out the websites for your local, um, local state um, public health departments and what their recommendations are, because there are some differences with what the CDC is recommending um, versus what's going on at a local and community level. So I always say just, you know, do a quick Google search and, and just see what the recommendations are um, in your particular area. But closing down schools and things like that, I don't know if it's necessarily warranted just yet. I think um, a lot of conferences and, um, you know, things like that where you're congregating large groups of people, mm -hmm. um, those sort of exposures um, can be limited to help contain the outbreak. Um, but then again, we, we have a bottleneck here because the testing methods have been so um, limited that we don't know if there has been sustained community acquisition of this and we just don't know it um, because of the, the testing. I don't think everybody needs to be tested, but um, I think um, we have to kind of keep that in mind that there might be some people that have it and just have mild infection. And are just walking around normally. And I'm just walking around, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and do you know how long the incubation period is and uh, how long it takes for it to be uh, transmissible between individuals? Yeah. So um, the data that's come out from the Chinese study show that the incubation period is probably around five days or so um, before onset of symptoms. So the quarantines that you probably read for the 14 days um, is, is like an overestimate, most likely. Um, I think in the coming weeks, we'll have more information and um, those recommendations for, for self-quarantine and um, you know, in post-quarantine might change to be a little bit less, but we just don't know. We're doing 14 days as like sort of the catch-all, but um, tr really and truly, it's about five days um, between you and an exposure to an individual with COVID-19 and onset of symptoms, five to seven days. And um, when is the virus the most infectious period? Um, yeah, so, so, so that we don't know, but what we think is um, considered true um, contact with someone is basically you and that person, there's about you know six feet or less in between you and you've been um, in the same area for more than 10 minutes. 
okay. that's probably a higher risk of transmission. So if people are feeling the symptoms that you said earlier, the best thing that they could do for themselves and for the community is just stay home until they feel better. Yeah, stay home. You know, if you've got a high fever with cough, runny nose, there's no reason for you to be um, out and about and trying to tough it out. You know, we just um, really recommend that people stay at home and rest and, and take it easy to get over these things. I mean, typically with respiratory viruses, um, I will say that you have to be without fever for at least 24 hours um, before you can kind of go back into um, real life and all of your other activities. And, and in terms of developing a vaccine for this, I know there are a couple of vaccines that are being shipped out to be tested. I mean, how far do you think we are potentially from having, I know that's a loaded question, but. Yeah, that's a loaded question. I mm -hmm. think, um, Vaccine is definitely our best bet. And if we can get something within the next 12 months, that would be fantastic and absolutely amazing. Um, the, there are clinical trials for other options, including treatments, um, specifically something called remdesivir. Mm -hmm. um, those are ongoing right now um, within China and then also within the United States um, amongst people who have been infected. Um, but our best bet is to get a vaccine, um, especially to our most vulnerable population, our elderly and, and those with other conditions, uh, and hopefully in the next 12 months or so. So do you, uh, do you think that on a world scale, just a philosophical question, we were prepared for a pandemic like this. I think overall, personally, uh, we've done a fabulous job of containing it and slowing it down as much as possible because if this was in the 1900s it would probably blow up a lot faster. Yeah. I think um, one of the things that we have to keep in mind is like when you look at the SARS era in early 2000s um, the Chinese government and you know other governments we, we they weren't sharing this information as readily you know they're kind of sometimes hiding some of the cases and things like that, but they've been extremely transparent in this situation about sharing data and, 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 and sharing how many cases they're seeing and really sharing the genome of the virus so researchers can um, start developing types of treatments and cures and vaccines. So um, they've been a lot more transparent than in the past. And because of our technological revolution, we're able to um, really pinpoint any sort of like cases or new infection that's rising, we're able to kind of um, alert the um, emergency preparedness teams and kind of get things in motion. But I do think from a healthcare and insurance standpoint, there are a lot of barriers um, that we still face and um, that, you know, limit the containment of such outbreaks. But overall, I'm very optimistic with the way this has, has been handled so far. So we've learned a lot, I guess, from this as well, but moving forward, I think we'll be even more prepared and, and transparency, especially in the scientific world is a must, I think, in order to contain these kinds of things. Absolutely. And, and I, I remember reading, it was like within a month or so that, you know, they had already sequenced the genome of this thing. And I was very, very shocked, like how rapidly things were, were moving in the scientific front. Yeah, it's incredible actually. and. You know, there was a lot of talk initially about how this is a bat virus, and we quickly realized that there's probably, an, there definitely is an intermediate animal host um, that the virus is more similar to. Um, and so the question is now, let's try to figure out what that host is um, in the efforts to also help contain it. Um, so. so that part of it is still not nailed down. Uh, yeah, so um, they found this bat virus. It's really interesting. So in southern China, <laughs> there is, um, I believe it's a horseshoe bat um, that they found about 96% homology with the new um, coronavirus. And, um, it, but it still wasn't perfect, right? Because the coronavirus has these spike proteins on the outside and there was a, re a different receptor domain um, binding site and that led us to believe that there was another animal reservoir in between 
um, the bats and the humans. Um, and so that is sort of yet to be determined. Um, one of the animals that we think might be the intermediate host is an animal called uh, the pangolin. Um, and that is a, a, a basically like a scaly mammal um, that is the most traded um, legal animal in the world. Um, and basically it's used, the scales are thought to have some medicinal properties, but um, the meat is, is sold all over the world. And that might be something that comes up in the future as a potential um, intermediate host for this virus. I see. I guess they could be used as a model model to studying how the virus has evolved, right? I mean, if it does turn out. Yeah, off. absolutely, absolutely. And then, you know, um, in the past, some of the containment strategies also um, involved kind of um, addressing those, you know, animals, the animal um, from preventing the spread from animal to human. Um, so what kind of public health and hygiene measures and um, things can be taken to prevent um, additional spread? Interesting from a, a epidemiological point of view, how um, yeah. we could narrow it down to the exact animal. And, and, and it's quite interesting with all the advances in technology and science, like you're saying, to be able to even determine different strains, the origin it, and the pace at which it was happening. You know, uh, it, it's quite remarkable. And the sharing of ideas and information is, I think, the key in, in, in slowing down something like this and preventing it from flowing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, we have to kind of um, take what the media is doing with this and take it with a grain of salt and, and read information from good resources, from CDC, from your local public health departments, um, you speak to your physicians, you know, and, and also keep in mind that this might be something that, you know, is just circulating amongst us. So it might be something that we have to kind of deal with on an ongoing basis. So it might be next winter, it's, it's cold flu and COVID-19 season, and we have to kind of um, be prepared for that too. And, um, and I know I've been stressing people a lot about getting their vaccines and being up to date about their vaccine. Do you think, um, of course, having all of these done, can prevent you from getting sick even from something like this. You know, if your immune system is well uh, educated and is healthy and is able to fight all these other infections, then it might not have a harder time fighting something like this in the future. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think if your immune system has been primed with, you know, the flu vaccine, for example, um, it's, it's kind of prepared to fight against other types of respiratory viruses. Um, it, it can only help in this sort of situation. Um, so definitely encourage everyone to get their flu shot, especially those with respiratory conditions and asthma um, and other immunocompromised states. Um, less than 50% of the population of the U.S. gets their flu vaccine every year, which is staggering to me. Yeah. And, um, you know, and we have more than 20,000 deaths this season alone. So I really do um, want to encourage everyone to get their flu vaccine because it's 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 way bigger than the COVID-19. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and we know it's definitely cyclical, so it's not like the flu ever will go away. This this has a potential to go away maybe right. in a couple of years, but the flu will always be there. So, I, I mean, I've been trying to stress it to people to make sure they get the flu vaccine. And when I compare the numbers between like you're doing with the flu and this, uh, people sometimes... Um, only then see the importance of the flu vaccine. Yeah. You, know? you know, I think we need to start calling the flu maybe like, you know, XL58 or give it a new name. <laughs> give it a scary, people, scary name, yeah. huh? Yeah, give it a, a new scary name. Maybe we can call it COVID-3 or something. I don't know. Um, but it's just um, something that's been a problem every single year, just sort of sometimes breeds indifference when something new and novel sort of catches our attention uh, as a society. So uh, we should also keep that in mind. Okay, well, this has been very informative. I know for me as well, even as a physician. So I think the, the viewers are gonna definitely uh, enjoy hearing all of this. Do you have any last sort of additional comments to make before? 
Um, I would just say, you know, stay informed. And um, of course, everything that I've said today is a very uh, rapidly evolving topic. So um, please, you know, keep that in mind and wash your hands and yeah. hop in your sleep. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. And always consult your personal physician if you have any of these symptoms to get a better idea on what's going on. And uh, make sure uh, you take this as a sort of an educational thing rather than a medical advice and always consult your personal physician. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Akon. Thank you so much for having me, uh, for uh, coming on to this and educating all of us about the details and some of the important questions that people had been asking. All right, thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, you too. Bye. Bye.